Julius Caesar, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part One, Paragraphs One to Nineteen. Julius Caesar the Divine lost his father when he was in the sixteenth year of his age, and the year following, being nominated to the office of High Priest of Jupiter, he repudiated Cossutia who was very wealthy, although her family belonged only to the equestrian order, and to whom he had been contracted when he was a mere boy. He then married Cornelia, the daughter of Cinna, who was four times consul, and had by her shortly afterwards a daughter named Julia. Resisting all the efforts of the dictator Scylla to induce him to divorce Cornelia, he suffered the penalty of being stripped of his sacerdotal office, his wife's dowry, and his own patrimonial estates, and, being identified with the adverse faction, was compelled to withdraw from Rome. After changing his place of concealment nearly every night, although he was suffering from a quartan ague, and having effected his release by bribing the officers who had tracked his footsteps, he at length obtained a pardon through the intercession of the Vestal Virgins and of Mamercus Emilius and Aurelius Cotter, his near relatives. We are assured that when Scylla, having withstood for a while the entreaties of his own best friends, persons of distinguished rank, at last yielded to their importunity, he exclaimed, either by a divine impulse or from a shrewd conjecture, your suit is granted, and you may take him among you. But know, he added, that this man, for whose safety you are so extremely anxious, will some day or other be the ruin of the party of the nobles, in defence of which you are leagued with me, for in this one Caesar you will find many a Marius. His first campaign was served in Asia on the staff of the praetor Marcus Thermus, and being dispatched into Bithynia to bring thence a fleet, he loitered so long at the court of Nicomedes as to give occasion to reports of a criminal intercourse between him and that prince, which received additional credit from his hasty return to Bithynia under the pretext of recovering a debt due to a freedman, his client. The rest of his service was more favourable to his reputation, and when Mytilene was taken by storm, he was presented by Thermus with the civic crown. He served also in Cilicia under Servilius Isauricus, but only for a short time, as upon receiving intelligence of Scylla's death he returned with all speed to Rome, in expectation of what might follow from a fresh agitation set on foot by Marcus Lepidus. Distrusting, however, the abilities of this leader, and finding the times less favourable for the execution of this project than he had at first imagined, he abandoned all thoughts of joining Lepidus, although he received the most tempting offers. Soon after this civil discord was composed, he preferred a charge of extortion against Cornelius Dolabella, a man of consular dignity who had obtained the honour of a triumph. On the acquittal of the accused, he resolved to retire to Rhodes, with the view not only of avoiding the public odium which he had incurred, but of prosecuting his studies with leisure and tranquillity under Apollonius, the son of Molon, at that time the most celebrated master of rhetoric. While on his voyage thither in the winter season, he was taken by pirates near the island of Pharmacusa, and detained by them, burning with indignation, for nearly forty days, his only attendants being a physician and two chamberlains. For he had instantly dispatched his other servants and the friends who accompanied him to raise money for his ransom. Fifty talents having been paid down, he was landed on the coast, when, having collected some ships, 
he lost no time in putting to sea in pursuit of the pirates, and having captured them, inflicted upon them the punishment with which he had often threatened them in jest. At that time Mithridates was ravaging the neighbouring districts, and on Caesar's arrival at Rhodes, that he might not appear to lie idle while danger threatened the allies of Rome, he passed over into Asia, and having collected some auxiliary forces and driven the king's governor out of the province, retained in their allegiance the cities which were wavering and ready to revolt. Having been elected military tribune, the first honour he received from the suffrages of the people after his return to Rome, he zealously assisted those who took measures for restoring the tribunician authority, which had been greatly diminished during the usurpation of Scylla. He likewise, by an act, which Plotius, at his suggestion, propounded to the people, obtained the recall of Lucius Cinna, his wife's brother, and others with him, who, having been the adherents of Lepidus in the civil disturbances, had, after that consul's death, fled to Sertorius, which law he supported by a speech. During his quaestorship he pronounced funeral orations from the rostra, according to custom, in praise of his aunt Julia and his wife Cornelia. In the panegyric on his aunt he gives the following account of her own and his father's genealogy on both sides. My aunt Julia derived her descent by the mother from a race of kings, and by her father from the immortal gods. For the Marcii Reges, her mother's family, deduced their pedigree from Ancus Martius, and the Julii, her father's, from Venus, of which stock we are a branch. We therefore unite in our descent the sacred majesty of kings, the chiefest among men, and the divine majesty of gods, to whom kings themselves are subject. To supply the place of Cornelia, he married Pompeia, the daughter of Quintus Pompeius, and granddaughter of Lucius Scylla but he afterwards divorced her upon suspicion of her having been debauched by Publius Clodius, for so current was the report that Clodius had found access to her disguised as a woman during the celebration of a religious solemnity that the Senate instituted an inquiry respecting the profanation of the sacred rites. Father Spain fell to his lot as quaestor, when there, as he was going the circuit of the province by commission from the praetor for the administration of justice, and had reached Gades, seeing a statue of Alexander the Great in the temple of Hercules, he sighed deeply, as if weary of his sluggish life, for having performed no memorable actions at an age at which Alexander had already conquered the world. He, therefore, immediately sued for his discharge, with the view of embracing the first opportunity which might present itself in the city of entering upon a more exalted career. In the stillness of the night following, he dreamt that he lay with his own mother, but his confusion was relieved, and his hopes were raised to the highest pitch by the interpreters of his dream, who expounded it as an omen that he should possess universal empire, for that the mother who in his sleep he had found submissive to his embraces was no other than the earth, the common parent of all mankind. Quitting therefore the province before the expiration of the usual term, he betook himself to the Latin colonies, which were then eagerly agitating the design of obtaining the freedom of Rome, and he would have stirred them up to some bold attempt, had not the consuls, to prevent any commotion, detained for some time the legions which had been raised for service in Cilicia. But this did not deter him from making, soon afterwards, a still greater effort within the precincts of the city itself. For only a few days before he entered upon the aedileship, he incurred a suspicion of having engaged in a conspiracy with Marcus Crassus, a man of consular rank, to whom were joined Publius Scylla and Lucius Autronius, who, after they had been chosen consuls, 
were convicted of bribery. The plan of the conspirators was to fall upon the Senate at the opening of the new year, and murder as many of them as should be thought necessary, upon which Crassus was to assume the office of dictator, and appoint Caesar his master of the horse. When the commonwealth had been thus ordered according to their pleasure, the consulship was to have been restored to Scylla and Autronius. Mention is made of this plot by Tanusius Geminus in his History, by Marcus Bibulus in his Edicts, and by Curio the Father in his Orations. Cicero likewise seems to hint at this in a letter to Axius, where he says that Caesar had in his consulship secured to himself that arbitrary power to which he had aspired when he was aedile. Tanusius adds that Crassus, from remorse or fear, did not appear upon the day appointed for the massacre of the Senate, for which reason Caesar omitted to give the signal which according to the plan concerted between them he was to have made. The agreement, Curio says, was that he should shake off the toga from his shoulder. We have the authority of the same Curio and of Marcus Actorius Naso for his having been likewise concerned in another conspiracy with young Cnaeus Piso, to whom, upon a suspicion of some mischief being meditated in the city, the province of Spain was decreed out of the regular course. It is said to have been agreed between them that Piso should head a revolt in the provinces whilst the other should attempt to stir up an insurrection at Rome, using as their instruments the Lambroni and the tribes beyond the Po. But the execution of this design was frustrated in both quarters by the death of Piso. In his aedileship he not only embellished the Comitium and the rest of the Forum with the adjoining halls, but adorned the capital also, with temporary piazzas constructed for the purpose of displaying some part of the superabundant collections he had made for the amusement of the people. He entertained them with the hunting of wild beasts, and with games, both alone and in conjunction with his colleague. On this account he obtained the whole credit of the expense to which they had jointly contributed, insomuch that his colleague, Marcus Bibulus, could not forbear remarking that he was served in the manner of Pollux, for as the temple erected in the forum to the two brothers went by the name of Castor alone, so his and Caesar's joint munificence was imputed to the latter only. To the other public spectacles exhibited to the people, Caesar added a fight of gladiators, but with fewer pairs of competence than he had intended for he had collected from all parts so great a company of them, that his enemies became alarmed, and a decree was made restricting the number of gladiators which any one was allowed to retain at Rome. Having thus conciliated popular favour, he endeavoured, through his interest with some of the tribunes, to get Egypt assigned to him as a province by an act of the people. The pretext alleged for the creation of this extraordinary government was that the Alexandrians had violently expelled their king, whom the Senate had complimented with the title of an ally and friend of the Roman people. This was generally resented, but notwithstanding there was so much opposition from the faction of the nobles that he could not carry his point. In order, therefore, to diminish their influence by every means in his power, he restored the trophies erected in honour of Gaius Marius on account of his victories over Jugurtha, the Cimbri, and the Teutoni, which had been demolished by Scylla. And when sitting in judgment upon murderers, he treated those as assassins who, in the late prescription, had received money from the treasury for bringing in the heads of Roman citizens, although they were expressly accepted in the Cornelian laws. He likewise suborned some one to prefer an impeachment for treason against Gaius Riberius, by whose especial assistance the Senate had, a few years before, put down Lucius Saturninus the seditious tribune, and being drawn by lot a judge on the trial, 
he condemned him with so much animosity that upon his appealing to the people no circumstance availed him so much as the extraordinary bitterness of his judge. Having renounced all hope of obtaining Egypt for his province, he stood candidate for the office of chief pontiff, to secure which he had recourse to the most profuse bribery. Calculating on this occasion the enormous amount of the debts he had contracted, he is reported to have said to his mother, when she kissed him at his going out in the morning to the assembly of the people, I will never return home unless I am elected pontiff. In effect, he left so far behind him two most powerful competitors, who were much his superiors both in age and rank, that he had more votes in their own tribes than they both had in all the tribes together. After he was chosen praetor, the conspiracy of Catiline was discovered, and while every other member of the Senate voted for inflicting capital punishment on the accomplices in that crime, he alone proposed that the delinquents should be distributed for safe custody among the towns of Italy, their property being confiscated. He even struck such terror into those who were advocates for greater severity by representing to them what universal odium would be attached to their memories by the Roman people, that Decius Silanus, consul-elect, did not hesitate to qualify his proposal it not being very honourable to change it, by a lenient interpretation, as if it had been understood in a harsher sense than he intended, and Caesar would certainly have carried his point, having brought over to his side a great number of the senators, among whom was Cicero, the consul's brother, had not a speech by Marcus Cato infused new vigour into the resolutions of the senate. He persisted, however, in obstructing the measure, until a body of the Roman knights, who stood under arms as a guard, threatened him with instant death if he continued his determined opposition. They even thrust at him with their drawn swords, so that those who sat next him moved away, and a few friends, with no small difficulty, protected him by throwing their arms round him and covering him with their togas. At last, deterred by this violence, he not only gave way, but absented himself from the Senate House during the remainder of that year. Upon the first day of his praetorship, he summoned Quintus Catulus to render an account to the people respecting the repairs of the capital, proposing a decree for transferring the office of curator to another person. But being unable to withstand the strong opposition made by the aristocratical party, whom he perceived quitting in great numbers their attendance upon the new consuls, and fully resolved to resist his proposal, he dropped the design. He afterwards approved himself a most resolute supporter of Cecilius Metallus, tribune of the people, who, in spite of all opposition from his colleagues, had proposed some laws of a violent tendency, until they were both dismissed from office by a vote of the Senate. He ventured, notwithstanding, to retain his post and continue in the administration of justice, but finding that preparations were made to obstruct him by force of arms, he dismissed the lictors, threw off his gown, and betook himself privately to his own house, with the resolution of being quiet in a time so unfavourable to his interests. He likewise pacified the mob, which two days afterwards flocked about him, and in a riotous manner made a voluntary tender of their assistance in the vindication of his honour. This happening contrary to expectation, the Senate, who met in haste on account of the tumult, gave him their thanks by some of the leading members of the House, and sending for him, after high commendation of his conduct, cancelled their former vote, and restored him to his office. But he soon got into fresh trouble, being named amongst the accomplices of Catiline, both before Novius Niger the Quaestor, by Lucius Vetius the Informer, and in the Senate by Quintus Curius, to whom a reward had been voted for having first discovered the designs of the conspirators. 
Curious affirmed that he had received his information from Catiline. Vetius even engaged to produce in evidence against him his own handwriting given to Catiline. Caesar, feeling that this treatment was not to be borne, appealed to Cicero himself whether he had not voluntarily made a discovery to him of some particulars of the conspiracy, and so balked Curious of his expected reward. He therefore obliged Vetius to give pledges for his behaviour, seized his goods, and, after heavily fining him, and seeing him almost torn in pieces before the rostra, threw him into prison, to which he likewise sent Novius the Quister, for having presumed to take an information against a magistrate of superior authority. At the expiration of his praetorship, he obtained by lot the father's Spain, and pacified his creditors, who were for detaining him, by finding sureties for his debts. Contrary, however, to both law and custom, he took his departure before the usual equipage and outfit were prepared. It is uncertain whether this precipitancy arose from the apprehension of an impeachment, with which he was threatened on the expiration of his former office, or from his anxiety to lose no time in relieving the allies, who implored him to come to their aid. He had no sooner established tranquillity in the province than, without waiting for the arrival of his successor, he returned to Rome with equal haste to sue for a triumph and the consulship. The day of election, however, being already fixed by proclamation, he could not legally be admitted a candidate unless he entered the city as a private person. On this emergency he solicited a suspension of the laws in his favour, but such an indulgence being strongly opposed, he found himself under the necessity of abandoning all thoughts of a triumph, lest he should be disappointed of the consulship. Of the two other competitors for the consulship, Lucius Lucius and Marcus Bibulus, he joined with the former, upon condition that Lucius, being a man of less interest but greater affluence, should promise money to the electors in their joint names, upon which the party of the nobles, dreading how far he might carry matters in that high office with a colleague disposed to concur in and second his measures, advised Bibulus to promise the voters as much as the other, and most of them contributed towards the expense Cato himself admitting that bribery under such circumstances was for the public good. He was accordingly elected consul jointly with Bibulus. Actuated still by the same motives, the prevailing party took care to assign provinces of small importance to the new consuls, such as the care of the woods and roads. Caesar, incensed at this indignity, endeavoured by the most assiduous and flattering attentions to gain to his side Cnaeus Pompey, at that time dissatisfied with the Senate for the backwardness they showed to confirm his acts after his victories over Mithridates. He likewise brought about a reconciliation between Pompey and Marcus Crassus, who had been at variance from the time of their joint consulship in which office they were continually clashing and he entered into an agreement with both that nothing should be transacted in the government which was displeasing to any of the three. End of Julius Caesar, Part 1 Recording by Graham Redman After changing his place of concealment nearly every night, although he was suffering from a quartan ague, and having effected his release by bribing the officers who had tracked his footsteps, he at length obtained a pardon through the intercession of the Vestal Virgins and of Mamercus Emilius and Aurelius Cotter, his near relatives. We are assured that when Scylla, having withstood for a while the entreaties of his own best friends, persons of distinguished rank, a boy. He then married Cornelia, the daughter of Cinna, who was four times consul, 
and had by her shortly afterwards a daughter named Julia. Resisting all the efforts of the dictator Scylla to induce him to divorce Cornelia, he suffered the penalty of being stripped of his sacerdotal office, his wife's dowry, and his own patrimonial estates, and, being identified with the adverse faction, was compelled to withdraw from Rome, and edited by T. Forrester. Julius Caesar, Part One, Paragraphs 1 to 19 Julius Caesar, the divine, lost his father when he was in the sixteenth year of his age, and the year following, being nominated to the office of high priest of Jupiter, he repudiated Cossutia, who was very wealthy, although her family belonged only to the equestrian order, and to whom he had been contracted when he was a mere Julius Caesar, Part One of the Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Lives of the Twelve Caesars by Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus. Translated by Alexander Thompson, at last yielded to their importunity, he exclaimed, either by a divine impulse or from a shrewd conjecture, Your suit is granted, and you may take him among you. But know, he added, that this man, for whose safety you are so extremely anxious, will some day or other be the ruin of the party of the nobles, in defence of which you are leagued with me. For in this one Caesar you will find many a Marius.' 